Welcome to the Wild Pitch Podcast, hosted by Brian Gales, Jimmy Gales, Brian Dorsey, and Christopher Rojas. Well, here we are again for yet another episode of the Wild Pitch Podcast, uh, minus Brian Dorsey. Um, it's supposed to be four of us doing this podcast, but like you said, maybe he was a guest. <laughs> he was our week <laughs> one guest, and we'll make gonna, him a, a guest here and there as we move <clears throat> forward. It's going to go over well with him when he hears this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to you gotta bust chops, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, tonight or this episode, we want to dive into Modus Global, and you know everybody knows Brian Gell's here. He's a silent assassin, and you know if you're listening in your car or your home and your kids are screaming when he opens his mouth in his podcast, you want to pump up the volume, maybe pull <laughs> off the side of the road. <laughs> Because when he speaks, it's gold. He doesn't say much, but it is gold. But tonight, we're going to get a heavy dose of him. <laughs> and we're going to, you know, basically he works for Modus Global, and uh, he's been working there. How long, Brian? Six years. Six years. He's my brother. I still don't know what Modus does. <laughs> um, I think he'll give us a good little uh, insight. Chris... Rojas here at New York Tech uses the Modus technology. We do. But let's just get into <clears throat> what this does and a little bit about the analytics of pitching and everything you've done. So explain what Modus does. We'll just start from there. Go ahead, yeah, Brian. Just give a, a little background on, on the company. Um, the company was founded in 2010 uh, with a background in biomechanical analysis. So. In 2011, Modus set up a lab at IMG Academy where, you know, a very high-end training um, academy. It's a school. It gave Modus access to high-end athletes across all sports, but predominantly baseball. Um, and the goal of the company was to bring wearable, uh, well, bring the lab experience to the field through wearable tech. So explain, like, the lab used to be, like, all the sensors, yeah. right? And how many cameras, I remember? Yeah, so, like, for Modus, we would have between 8 and 16 um, high-speed 3D motion capture cameras. So when, at, when athletes would go through an assessment, they'd be in their compression uh, shorts with markers on their body, so reflective markers, um, 50 of them. So similar to uh, when you create a video game. And Which Jimmy and Chris have have experienced we've, we've this been and have been stars have been talent the we've talent, been the talent. You know, they were they're in um rbi uh rbi baseball rbi baseball kids parents anybody that plays yeah all those awesome movements that's me and chris yeah <laughs> it's, uh, Do did dorsey do one too brian dorsey did one too yeah. yeah um yeah so you know basically the founders they had they had been in, in the video game industry. They um, did all the animation for Grand Theft Auto. They did some movies, The Matrix. So they sold that company, signed a non-compete, and decided to take this technology into, into sports. But in the lab environment, it's you don't get, you know, it's tough to test guys in your compression shorts with these markers. You know, they almost look like mini light bulbs on the body. Um, we would see guys in the minor league level that throw 95 miles an hour and do the testing they're doing for throwing 80 you know and it's a controlled environment it's in right. a it's in a it's in a cage so like i was mentioning the goal of the company was to bring that lab experience to the field through wearable tech so in 2014 uh we debuted the product with nine teams during fall instructs um and it was what, basically it, what is the product though so it's it's um it's an IMU sensor, so it consists of accelerometers and gyroscopes. Um, accelerometers measuring the speed, the acceleration, gyroscopes, basically the orientation, where the sensor is in space to get different arm angles. And um, So for every throw, the sleeve, it gets arm slot, it gets your arm speed, your max shoulder rotation, and the peak valgus torque, right? so. Which means what in layman's term? What's that peak value of it's, torque? It's the stress that's that's imparted on the arm, the right. UCL. Yeah. So and that, the sensor oops, in that layback, right? When they when they get into yeah. That, so yeah. that's where where your peak value torque is going to be when your arm is basically maxed. That max, like yeah. you're saying, the layback. Yeah. You know, it's almost it's like 180 degrees or so. Almost parallel to the ground, right? Yep. Yeah. 
Exactly. So, but the the sleeve is a typical compression sleeve with a pocket in it to hold the sensor over the UCL, mm -hmm. which is the ligament. And it's that really not invasive, uh, from my experience. It's yeah, it's it's a, it's a typical compression sleeve. Yeah. Uh, the sensor is small enough; it's weightless. You know, guys yeah. don't feel it at all. Um, and so, in 2000. 14, we debuted with nine major league teams. 2015, it was the first piece of wearable tech approved for in-game use by MLB. Uh, by MLB. Um, Trevor Bauer had w wore, donated his to the Hall of Fame. So in, in is that right? Now, yeah, 2015, that. 2016. Cool. Yeah, yeah, the sleeve made it to the Hall of Fame, which was pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, but he didn't wear the sensor, right, in the game. Bauer would wear it like off season, and I think he might have been wearing it a little bit in spring training. Um, but his picture was with the sleeve in the Hall of Fame. So we've been at it with the sleeve for about five years now. Um, about 20 to 25 of the major league teams use it. You know, countless NCAA programs from Division One, Division th uh, Two, Three, NAIA programs, junior colleges, um, you know, some of the top high schools and travel right. organizations. So it's it's gotten widespread. I mean, it's still, it's got a ways to go. Um, but the main objective is that, or the most important measurement that we found was that valgus torque, that peak valgus torque, because with that, that allows us to get these workload measures. For, so for a pitcher, each and every day, not only are we counting throws, but we're counting the amount of stress for each of those throws. Because so they coming, vary. They vary, yeah. yeah. Every throw is different. So whether you're playing catch, long toss, different distances, right. bullpen, game, different pitch types. Yeah. So we and get this all daily. All of the data comes from the sensor to an app on your phone, correct? Yeah. So it, it there's two ways. You could see it in live mode if you're connected. Um that's limited really to bullpen. Um, so it connects via Bluetooth and you can see in live mode. But for what most guys do is they'll charge the sensor up, go out and throw all day, then sync the data after the right. fact. And then so, get the, that's so what like, you guys do. Right, so that's what we do. And you know, um, we have 23 guys on the sleeve throughout the whole off season up until this point. And it's, you know, it's great because, and what we do is we take one of the injured guys you know, and have him essentially be our uh, our, our data guy to mm -hmm. collect all the sensors, charge them up, upload the data. Then I go into the, and I log into the dashboard, the Modus dashboard, and I go ahead and I review each individual. And mm -hmm. I start to map out what it is, you know, I have, in, uh, in, you know, I map out what I have planned for them and then I make adjustments based on the information that I'm, and the feedback that I'm getting, so. Yeah, and, and so, and just getting back to it's kind of the workload measurements, so for each, every day, for each player, we're getting this daily workload number. Um, and we're taking that number and we're applying it to a concept called acute to chronic workload ratio. So this was developed by Dr. Tim Gabbett, who was using uh, GPS monitors in rugby players. Uh, so he, he, he was measuring the total body workload for these rugby players and what what he found was when a, a player increased their workload by 50 percent or more prone to injury yeah there was a huge rise in soft tissue injuries so we applied that concept with the help of dr uh, gabbett um to the elbow so we applied that same concept to the out elbow and, and, and it was more specific too because he was looking at the whole body now we're just looking narrowing it down yeah, yeah. Down, at the, down at the elbow so what the acute to chronic workload is, you have these two numbers now. So now you have an acute number and a chronic. So for us, it first started looking back at the last seven days. Um, we changed it though after looking at some of the data sets and um, and injuries and, and correlations. But So what's the window so, for acute? So acute now is a nine day. It's a weighted average. So we're looking back at this daily workload num number over the last nine days, but today counts more than nine days ago. More impact. Yes, exactly. Slightly. Um, and then the, the chronic number is looking back at the last 28 days. So basically, that, that cr so it's a rolling 28-day average of the daily workload number. Um, so what the chronic is, really a level of fitness. How well, how conditioned this pitcher is to handle the workload. 
the acute is a, more, a level of fatigue. So I, because as guys increase their, their acute workload, you know, that's their recent workload, um, they're fatiguing if, if they're not conditioned properly for that, yeah. for that workload. So ideally in season, you know, you try to keep that, that AC ratio, so that acute divided by the chronic at about a one. So guys are maintaining that same workload. Through some studies, third-party studies, we found that when an AC ratio is 1.3 or higher, meaning that player increases workload by 30% or more, they're up to 25 times more likely to get hurt. So everything that spike. yeah, so, so everything we're doing, we're trying to to keep these players in a safe zone. We're trying to monitor workload uh, and prescribe workload based on this acute to chronic workload ratio, based on AC ratio. Now, when you take a pitcher and say it's December, they first start throwing. You know, obviously they they're not going to stay at a one because they have to build up this chronic. Right, so it's going to spike, right? That AC and it spikes a little bit, yeah, yeah, because you're not, you know, you just started throwing. But the idea is to increase the the chronic workload, so that AC ratio is probably going to be about maybe about a one point two. So we're going to increase workload uh, each week by about twenty percent. That way we can build them up uh, for opening day. And we build that number up, and by opening day, they're able to handle X amount of pitches. Um, through our, our dashboard, we're able to actually prescribe or basically let a, pitch, a coach or athlete know how many in-game throws they can make that day and what the resulting AC ratio will be. Right, the so, workload prescribed, right? Yeah. And it's measured by units, right? Those. So Exactly. Because you, you educated me on this, on how, and each, I guess each pitcher has their own, their unit may vary, right? As opposed to, they're not all the same. They don't, they don't yeah, all mirror they, each other. They're all a little, yeah, every guy is going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, some guys, just for whatever reason, put more stress on their arm. They throw harder. Um, and, and our data is normalized by height and weight um, for that workload number. But based off of some of the information being tagged, so we'll know, okay, long toss at this distance, it, it's this many workload units. Now as a pitching coach, you can start to customize throwing programs to that individual player and know what his AC ratio is going to be. Right. Where typically, especially in a return to play, when you have a guy that come, that's coming back from Tommy John, yeah. there's these cookie cutter uh, throwing programs. And the issue with that is they're also – you know, there's certain distances and throw counts. And then they're also telling the player to throw at different effort levels. We've done studies with Major League Baseball, HSS, Mayo Clinic, and players or athletes have a very a difficult time with perceived effort. So if you tell an athlete to go out there and throw 50% effort, more times than not, he's going to be closer to 100 it's interesting. So now with the sleeve, we can right. look at the torque in newton meters of how much stress they're putting on their arm. What what they actually did today, and now alter that program the next day so that they're making an adjustment. Um, we've seen some just looking back at the fact, looking at some professional guys who have been in a return to throw program and actually completely blow out their arm. And they had been wearing a sleeve, but unfortunately the team it was new to the team. They weren't using the data to to alter the program at all they were just kind of in a phase of capturing the data but even though throw counts and distances were similar in day to day the overall workload at times increased by a factor of four because probably the guy was feeling good right so what do you do as a as a player you push it you push it yeah you know and and if you don't have the technology you don't have this data you don't you don't really know um and when you push it too fast you fatigue your arm and that's what that's the issue because the pronator muscles are protective of the ucl when you're fatigued right that's when they're less protective and that ucl snaps and they've done some studies um where the basically the ucl should snap on if, if you didn't have muscle it would snap on every high effort that's throw. insane so it's just not made to withstand that that ligament itself is just not made to withstand that type of action. Exactly. So that's so why the strength the, is so big, and that's why fatigue is that's the number one um, predictor of injuries. I mean, well, you know, our our sleeve gives you newton meters of stress. So you may have a guy that 
he throws a fastball, he's got 75 newton meters of stress. And then there's a guy that's got throws a fastball, he's 50. You would think that guy that throws 70 has 75 newton meters of stress in it's every higher pitch, risk. higher risk. But it, there's been no correlation to that. You know, the only correlation has been fatigue. When guys are fatigued, they get hurt. You know, and, and it would be interesting to look at a guy like Severino coming back last year. Right, he maybe came back too quick, right? Yeah, I mean, he maybe. He kind of ramped up, really. Because I, I thought when they initially, I mean, not to digress, but I remember them, when they initially said he was coming back, they made it seem like he was only going to pitch out of the bullpen because he could only go a couple of, couple of innings. And all of a sudden, he was thrown right into the fire and starting again. Yeah. What was his injury again? Elbow? Tommy John. Tommy John. Oh, no, Tom, right, Tommy now he's got Tommy John now. No, but what was that? But it happened last year. But he said he started feeling it in that last game, the last game that he threw. Right. Oh. <clears throat> and they carried over, obviously, through this winter. They did all a bunch of tests, too, right? And they couldn't find it at first. And time. most injuries occur spring training. Right. So uh, talk about that because, you, you know, you, the ramp-up period is so, so crucial, right? Yeah. And so that's big. one of the things for me as a pitching coach. And, I, and Jimmy, I had this conversation, which was like, my, one, my end goal is when opening day starts – is to have everybody healthy, right? So, you know, we I think we err on the side of caution. Like where some programs will have their guys conditioned I mean, in a short window, I guess they try to get them conditioned to go 100 pitches, 115 pitches. You know, we try to stay short of that mark by a good margin with our starters and such because I don't, I don't want to have somebody, you know, get ramped up so quick to the point where all of a sudden after one out and now they're done for the season. You know I mean? And yeah, for you, us, a small You need program. them in May. Yeah, exactly. And that's, for us, that's a that's a big deal because we're not, you know, we're not an SEC program. We're going to roll out the 12th guy in the staff who's still probably high 80s. You know what I mean? My yeah. number one guy who's a D1 arm, I need him, I need him to pitch in May. I can't, yeah. you know, that. so that first game <laughs> isn't that crucial to me. You know? so. Yeah, no, and that's the biggest thing from, from Major League Baseball all the way down to Little League Baseball baseball i mean you think of it when we look at the numbers it takes three to four months to build up the chronic workload and that's why you see guys actually some of these professional guys they don't stop throwing you know maybe they're not they're not throwing off the mound um but they just continue they deload a little bit right. they continue to play catch so it's not they're not ever starting from zero because they know it takes too much time to build up that workload so when you look at the colleges the high schools um, you know, let's take a college program. You guys start practice, say, January 15th. You you start February 15th, a month later, right? Mm-hmm. That's no nowhere near enough right. time. So what are they doing to prior up. to that? Right. So yeah. you have to – and that's where we've had success as a company working with the colleges because they, the kids are going home with them. Right. You know, so now they know exactly what they're doing. They know if they're ready. And, yeah. and some of the programs that when kids are coming in, if they're not doing their throwing because they know – they're saying, hey, you're not you're not getting thrown off the mound. Yeah, you know we get we have to build that chronic workload up, and now you look at a at a high school, all right? Let's take high school tryouts. Probably starting about this week, right? Monday. When are scrimmages, games? Uh, yeah, end of week March, now, right? Maybe we can May a week and yeah. and twelve. But what are, days what later. is the typical high school coach going to do? They're going to look. Oh, Pitch Smart says this kid can throw ninety five pitches. All right. He's going to throw him 95 pitches. If that kid hasn't been throwing. He might not pick up a ball for the rest of the season. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it, you know, when, when we talk about the increased risk of injury by being a factor of 25, I mean, it's it's going from like 0.02 to a, a 2% chance right, of getting hurt. You that, know, when so you say injury, though, so can you elaborate on injury? Is it Are we talking surgery or are we just talking some type of – some some type of injury, yeah. Some type of injury that's gonna prevent you from throwing. You're gonna have some time off. I mean, more times than not, and maybe it's because when the, the schools are notifying us, the professional but I, teams. I think that's Im- that's important that people hear because when you think injury, what do you normally think? It's like an operation, right? right. Or surgery. Surgery. But injuries, like you said, sometimes it's just something that kind of pushes you, delays you, right? And then yeah. all of a sudden, you got to kind of start the clock all over. Again. Exactly. Yeah, we, and that's a, a great point because we've seen that if, if you don't pick up a ball for four or five days, that chronic workload dips really quick, and you gotta and then you're you gonna gotta spike spike it up. Yeah. 
you know, and I, I spent a lot of time talking with coaches, going over data and seeing guys where, you know, I'll see a number and I'll talk to them and, oh, that kid had the flu. And it totally, like, just those few days off just kind of can kill a season quickly. That's wild. Yeah. It's really good info. No, it really is because you know what? I, I've adjusted even, like, where I used to, you know, it's probably subscribed to very similar old school thought process. Well, time off is good, right? You know, you, you get, right. you're allowing yourself to recover. But we have guys that don't always we don't always get to use in games. So what do we do now? We have them throw more bull, bullpens. We keep them throwing. Have them throw more bullpens. We do more live sessions, yeah. right, to make sure that they're getting you know ample keeping that ac- acute I guess workload going right so that they're the chronic, still in shape. Yeah, and the the chronic, chronic, yeah, yeah. yeah so well, that they're still in shape. Build chronic, but yeah, mm-hmm. the acute is yeah doing it today. Um, and that's one of I w- I kind of think about. You, you look at the little league or you, you travel baseball, right? And you're looking at two kids. Who are you going to throw today, right? And you got one kid's been on vacation for a week. The other kid's been playing every day. Like who's more conditioned, conditioned or ready, suited to go out there and throw 100 pitches? And I, I would guess a 9 out of 10 coach would be like, oh, he hasn't thrown a ball in a week. He's, he's well rested. Right. But that's the kid that's going to go get fatigued, potentially hurt himself. Where the other kid that's throwing, so I mean, throwing is yeah, throwing is great. Like you have to throw. Yeah, just talking any kind of throwing, correct? Yeah, Yeah. Uh, yeah, any position, right? Because I I remember as an outfielder, um, every year going into fall ball, just tendonitis, my arm would kill me because you take that. You know, summer ball would end in and August. Take those two or three weeks off, right? Yeah, and all of a sudden you were right back into it right. playing, you know. And back then I think we played 30, 40 games in the fall. And you are you got scouts at the game, and you especially infield, outfield, and cuts and relays in college. And, yeah. again, it comes back to it really matters, and you ramped up, and you're just blowing it out. You know, we're really conscious of arm care – first few weeks of practice not because it's just you're so excited and we talk about all right. the time with the position players guarding yourself a little bit chill yeah. yeah and it's, so it's 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 ramping up carefully and th- but then maintaining maintaining and continuing to throw right and you know the one thing like with our product is you know it's not sexy when it's injury prevention people think oh I'm not going to get hurt right but if you told them the product would help them throw 90 miles an hour they do it. It's everyone's gonna buy right. it, right? Now, that being said, one, if you throw more, you're gonna increase your arm strength. You're gonna throw harder. Um, but what we've seen uh, is a strong correlation between this AC ratio and, and performance. So when guys have elevated number go, numbers going into the game, they don't pitch as well, right? But it makes sense because if it's elevated, that means they're probably gonna fatigue. They, they're not conditioned. You know, and it's it's similar, um, you know, to you and I going out running a marathon. We're not conditioned for that. You're not going to perform too well, you know. Right. And we're going to maybe probably hurt, I'm going to hurt myself trying to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, or or in a weight room, if you if you double your work workout in a weight room, right. you know, toast, <laughs> toast, <laughs> toast. Uh, and maybe maybe not. The, the hurt in the weight room is going to be soreness, maybe a little little strain, nothing nothing too crazy because you're not making those. Yeah, but those you're not picking up a weight for another few days, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but but if you were doing it really quick, you may yeah you could potentially tear something. Yeah. Um, but so, I think we've talked about this. Is this still the case where, you know, traditionally like last year we had a huge game. One of our starters, you know, he's an older guy. And he wasn't coming out of that game. His pitch count was getting up. But there's times when that guy's still good, right? And then, like, a guy with 60 pitches could be completely about to blow out, right? So it's not always the number. It's, like, it's these nu- these other numbers that you're talking about, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not always the pitch count. Right. The pitch yeah. count yeah. isn't and always the determining yeah, factor. That's, I mean, that's how you first educated me. This, yeah. starts to, this starts to give us a little more information to work off of, right? It's, yeah. it's not just a clicker anymore. Exactly, and and when you think about it, the pitch count—it's an arbitrary number. Who yeah. came? They came up with a, and the guys who came up with it actually, you know, we worked with closely at, at Modis at one point. Um, but it was just they threw out this hundred number, right? So who's to say? 
And when you look back at Nolan Ryan, he he threw 232 pitches in one game. But if you look at it, it wasn't that out of the norm for him because he consistently was throwing 160, 170. We know in between those starts what he was doing, right? Long throwing tossing. the football, long toss. Yeah. This guy was built up for that. He was conditioned to handle that. So you you talk about you know some of your guys that you've had and uh, and and you get. You get some outliers. The guys are just, for whatever reason, they they're not gonna get hurt, right? Yeah, the rubber yeah, arm, rubber yeah. arm, w- right. whatever it is, you know, it's not. Yeah, the physiology is not the yeah. same for everybody. But you know what I found the fascinating when we started using the motor sleeve. I can't believe how many throws kids actually made on a daily basis. I was blown away by that, and I'm yeah, a, we, I, we know, get that I a lot. My whole life, yeah. Right? I said, but I, I was, I was like, what, 180 throws today? I just had you throw up to ninety feet. What did, where did all these throws come from? You know, so and that and that's another great point because there's been some studies. University of Florida did a study um, where they just counted all the throws, right, and compared that to in game. And, and even on a start day, right, this it's about fifty percent of their in game throws from the right. total throws for that day. So when you start looking at kids, um. If on there, if you're just counting pitches in game, that's at such a it. small right. part of the of the story. You know, he's and and plus with the kids, they're playing shortstop, they're catching, and you know, so there's so much to it, and it's it's just at, at this point, it's kind of dumb not to monitor it. Right? Why wouldn't you? It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Educate. I, I I think, it, and it's just people don't know it's available to them you know or they they think it's it's too advanced and that's one thing we we've done a, a much better job over the last two years now having this story early on it was just data and it was kind of it wasn't actionable but it's gotten actionable the last two years where yeah now you we're prescribing you know we can right. actually tell you you how guys many also i mean without i guess i don't know because we'd have to probably be careful about naming people but you've saw professional athletes at the high level and their workload and and how and and we're able to determine you know what this guy's close to being on the wrong side of of the injury list right yeah so we we alerted a, a professional a major league organization last year that you know these five guys you've 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 put these guys at risk you know um so we were basically as a you know, consultant to them. Right. You know, they were asking us to to look at the data, and we said, you know, you, you guys are putting these guys at risk, and um, five four, people in particular. F- yeah, they were at that. They had they were put at risk most, and four of the five guys actually wound up getting hurt. That's amazing. That is yeah. Sick. That's all you need to know. Right. And they told them before they got hurt. Yeah. And what they do? How they respond to that? So th- that was sent to the GM. Um, we didn't get a reply. <laughs> there were some changes made in the organization, though. That's interesting. Yeah. So guys lost their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is wild. So what's Modus doing now, Brian? Like, what is? So. What's the next step for Modus? Well, a pretty going? big step, right? Yeah, right. so we were recently acquired by Driveline Baseball. And so for those of you who don't know, Driveline is, has emerged as one of the leaders in, in, in velocity protocols and arm care protocols, right, and developing. Yeah, I mean, just really like Driveline is a place where, you, where if you go train there, kind of there's no stone unturned you know you're going to go in there you're going to get an assessment you're going to get that full biomechanical right. analysis um depend so it, it's a combination of not only mechanics but the strength training the skill training you know and, and just to like so this a, is almost a p- perfect synergy right of, of i guess or marriage right of yeah it, it is because um you know they're at the forefront of developing players right now and especially integrating technology mm-hmm. aside from that 25 and, and growing of their in the last two years 25 of their employees have gone on to s- professional, to professional baseball yeah. yeah wow so you know they're they're looking to 
to kind of integrate and, and, and learn from these guys on mm -hmm. what they're doing on how they're developing players. Um, so yeah, it's just a it's a it's a perfect blend because they've they've started mostly they pitching and they've since since br uh, branched out into hitting as well. Um, but pitching has been kind of their forte, right? And just being able now to kind of have that in-house technology, and it's just constant with them. You know, having access to the facility, a full facility each and every day, and, and testing with guys. So now we're getting feedback on a daily basis, trying, you know, different form factors. Right now it's a sleeve, but looking at a wristband and different options, right. you know. Um, so I think we're gonna at some point we're gonna nail it on that just by just having instant feedback. Oh, so this is gonna help develop Modus even further. Yes, exactly. Yep, develop more products and 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 continue to look. Maybe there's other measures that we can that we can get, gain mm -hmm. and and looking at rehab protocols and um, because there are you know guys there that physical therapists guys going through rehab process so um, using the product on them. So yeah, it's a, and it's. It's an exciting time. It's going to really, I think it's going to enhance the product. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I think when you, I mean, I, I, I think when you can take technology of this magnitude and be able to forecast, you know, an individual athlete's, uh, you know, potential risk of injury, that is tremendous value, especially for an organization or a professional organization that's paying these guys millions and millions of dollars. Right. Right, and the only thing that makes them th th that that holds value is them being healthy. Well, what's your takeaway from your? Our guys are on it six months now. Every single guy has a sleeve. And what's your? What has been the benefit for your college pitching staff? I think the for me as the coach is being able to navigate through a roster of guys without missing a beat. Right, because sometimes you know if they're left to their own to do the work, and and it's and I can't have eyes on everybody. Uh, you know, I'm not sure who's getting their work in. I'm not sure who how much work is being done. Possibly, if I'm focused maybe on a handful of guys, and and I'm just prescribing to, let's say, you know, the other half. Hey, I need you to do this X Y Z throwing for the day or over the next two days. And then my focus shifts, but now I can I can go ahead and then pull all that data and start to really determine, you know, where guys are at in their stages of of progression and and workload and 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 and, and it paints a bigger picture for me, a, a clearer picture for me, I should say. Mm -hmm. So it's been instrumental, I think, and you know, knock on wood, it's been great in, in us having our guys prepared for the season. So you know, it's been a very useful product for us. Well, I know there's been days where you've come in with a plan. And, and based on the number, I've altered. It, you yeah. shut some guys down for that day. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be, that's insane. That's awesome. Yeah, you, you know, know, and you you try to go off the co communication with the with the athlete and how they're feeling, right? But you know, so they, like you said, perce perception, mm -hmm. their perception of what they feel, what or what intensity they they're working at, it's not necessarily, you know, spot on, right? So, yeah, you know. There's some communication involved, but you know, I'll, I'll err on the side of what the data is telling me right for right now, just so, especially when it, it relates to them being getting ready for the season, you know. So, so is there times when you say, "Hey, so and so, we're going to cut you back today. I don't yep. like your numbers," and they say, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm not feeling great." Oh, absolutely, really. Yeah, there's been cor direct correlation. That's awesome. No question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one thing I want to add is, we can't at, at Modus. I mean. We don't look to predict injuries or if a guy goes out and throws one time with the sleeve, we can't predict an injury, yeah. right? But this um, is over time. Yeah. It's over time and yeah. it's it's kind mm -hmm. of just looking back at how guys are used. And maybe in those cases, guys weren't throwing enough in between starts or they were just ramped up. Mm -hmm too quickly early in the year maybe there was a little bit of a lapse in, in days off we see in the minor league level from spring training to the first game that you have that little bit of a tra even those couple of days of travel time kind right. of driving to the affiliate yeah maybe not throwing well that's like that listen when, when it's daunting when we get the guys going and we're starting to first collect mm -hmm. the data and and they're getting ramped up it's nothing but red all down that dashboard right 
Yeah, which, which is and what, it, it, which which means they're you know in theory you know they're past the one point three mark. Yeah, right? and it takes yeah because obviously you, when you first start with the sleeve, it, it thinks you haven't thrown at all. Right, and it takes it takes about two weeks for that data. To, right, to so then it starts. So that's oh. what happens. So over oh. that two week span, then all of a sudden you start to see the number numbers start to level out. Exactly. So then after that initial two weeks is you know now the the, the information becomes a little more valuable. Mm-hmm. In my experience, and, yeah, and I've had conversations with you. Where I'll call you up and I've, I'll ask Brian. Brian, you know what? I saw this today, and he said, "What? What? what give me." The, we'll go through his his throwing history, and on the dashboard, and, his, and he'll tell me, "You know what? No, he's this is probably still in a safe space." You know, and, and sure enough, it's just like he said. There's, it's just a continued ramp up, you know. But um, but over when we over the six month process, it's been it's been instrumental for us to be able to you know have an idea where guys are at yeah i guess my point i don't i don't want guys to think that wearing a sleeve college coaches may see the information of oh that guy is gonna blow out it's not like yeah that, you know and it's more trying to manage that workload so it's precautionary you're optimized. it's yeah, another exactly. tool you have yep in your box because we like, get that at the major league level players association thinking that this information can be used against a guy in arbitration but it can't, you know. It's just it's 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 workload data and it's, and even well, if it, the guy is exposed different times, you know, like the you risk, said, even yeah. the, the the percentage injury is still relatively small. Right. You know. Well, I mean, if it was exact info, it'd be a billion dollar company. <laughs> You'd be solving every problem. But you guys are the closest to having an impact on injuries. I know, like, you talked about University of Arizona, right? I mean, like, the so few injuries because the guy was all about this. He mm-hmm. was an expert at MODIS, right? Yeah, that uh, Tarleton State, Brian Conger. Oh, what yeah. was it? Oh, Tarleton was, State. He, he, I mean, Arizona State had some success. Um, LSU's using it right now. Oh. They have some big-time arms. Okay, so, um, no, I was thinking of him. What, what was it, Tarleton? Tarleton State, yeah. So he had unbelievable track record. No injuries, yeah. And what we had one when a kid transferred in. Yep. That wasn't on the program. The time, yeah. Tommy John. Yeah. He was the only injury in the program while that guy was there. After he left, they stopped using it. They had like two or three right away. No way. Yeah. That's insane. That's awesome. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's crazy, right? Because he got hired by a major league team based on his research and his, you know, dedication to yeah. it. Yeah. Right. And that's no. That's another thing we found. I mean, so. A couple of years ago, we did an uh, NCAA study. So it was funded. Um, we had about 40 schools. I would say about 20 of those guys in that, that program are now working with professional teams. Not just because of MODIS, but just they were interested in the technology, they learned how to use it, mm-hmm. Rapsodo, all those other companies, and that's what these teams are looking for. Right. Well, the game's evolved, right? Yep. So, I mean, <clears throat> I think even for us as coaches, in the, you know, we played in an era where this wasn't really prevalent. You know, it, it wasn't part of the game. We didn't have cell phones back then. <laughs> yeah. So it's definitely there's the technology advancements have, have definitely impacted the game. And I find myself as a coach trying to educate myself now, you know, and 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 utilize them. And, again, for me, I, I still – they're tools in the, in the, in, in the yeah. toolbox. You know, I think, you know – by default, our experiences are what we probably lean on. But then, when you can access some of these tools, you know, it's what was great. I mean, and not to you know, not to get off a of modus, but just thinking about Rap Soto, um, you know, because of Rap Soto, I was able to show a kid, you know, a, a, a result that it was easy for me to, to, you know, through my, you know, I guess, past experience and through my through my eyes to 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 determine whether or not it was quality or not but he couldn't grasp it right because it's one thing he's not you know he's he's trying to execute it he's not seeing what i'm seeing potentially he's not understanding what i'm saying and then to be able to show him like well well here look this is where it's at and all of a sudden he's you know the light bulb goes off you know so mm-hmm. so you I mean you got to kind of have these things in your back pocket i think nowadays if especially if it's out there right and mm-hmm. so modus being one of those pr- those those technological products i think you know like i get I, i'll say it again my biggest goal is having these guys healthy you know because i need them I, we need them right so losing one of your top guys can be season over yeah yeah 
And, you know, kind of wrap it up, when we're talking about Tarleton, he spoke at the ABCA conference. That's, that's the uh, annual coaches convention, you know, 6,000 coaches this year was 7,000. He spoke there about how he utilized MODIS. Um, and the one thing he said, he got – he got 50 more innings out of his one, two, and three starters. So he bro- they broke the record um, in, for, for their college in strikeouts and all these stats because he had his best guys throwing more. He got into a 21-20 um, a 20 20, a game in, uh, in, the, in, the re- in the playoffs, the, uh, the conference playoffs. They won. The next day was a championship. Typically, you'd th- and he threw. He had to throw his one, two, three, and closer. In the first game. In the first game. In the in this, it was probably the semifinal oh, okay. game to get yeah. to the championship. So, championship next day. Typically, you would think, I can't Off use those limits. guys. Right. He looked at the numbers. They were good. They were good. They felt good. He went out there, threw all four guys again, got into the uh, regionals. <laughs> wow. You know, so it's not only like, oh, we want to. Baby guys, no, we'll sure. hold them back. Well, we, we had that similar condition guys last year. Yeah, yeah, we did it to one of our guys last year. Yeah. Um, but you could be crucified for that. Meanwhile, this guy had all the data. You know, all right? Good stuff, man. So that's yeah. great. So like the whole time, Brian, when you're speaking, I just kept thinking of like Will Ferrell in old school <laughs> when he blacked out. That was you. <laughs> but that's what I felt <laughs> like. I keep thinking about Brian. I was like, I blacked man, out. He's like, uh, <laughs> he must have blacked oh, out here. when he did the the the, the debate, right? Yeah, yeah in old school. Because <laughs> he started spitting out all this academic yeah, stuff. Yeah, Brian's <laughs> talking about what was that big word we used? You used today on the uh, what do you call that? With the arm, the back? layback. Oh, uh, the Galvis talk. Galvis uh, torque, Valgus torque, Valgus, Valgus, Valgus torque, yeah. Valgus torque, yeah. I was waiting for, ooh, I blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> so, but now as you can tell, he's the older brother, always right. He's always, got a razz, always, always, always digging yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, but he doesn't I, have I anything on your well. looks, man. I tell you that <laughs> he is one handsome. Fella. <laughs> he is, is that that guy carries a long way with that smile, boy. So. The force is strong. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So well, great job. Uh, it was good for the people to hear your voice and know who you are. And me and Chris will take over the conversation moving forward, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and hijack it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Modus, uh, what, you know, real quick, though, the people, uh, where can they get sleeves and stuff? Yeah, so on the website. So it, our website is modusglobal.com. Um, currently we're kind of facing some inventory issues, unfortunately. That's a good thing, guys. Yeah. Yeah, it is a good thing. I mean, we've, yeah. We've gone through some product, but recently we ran into some issues with the uh, coronavirus, so it's kind of uh, really? hindering us a little bit. Mm. But um, should have some small mediums in stock middle of this month, and then large is going to come in May. All right. Well, Chris, uh, let's close <clears throat> out the wild pitch. Well, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Until <laughs> next time. <laughs> you nailed it. 